Randy Chavez on the guitar right there. Great to have Randy with us, yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Are you feeling good? Pumped? It's baseball weather, and uh, I think we're feeling it. Um, pitchers and catchers report on February 13th, so you can feel the anticipation. This is when the Rockies are at their peak, and I think a lot of people are thinking about opening day. And uh, it reminded me, I think everybody's thinking now about the first president to ever throw out a pitch on opening day. Can you just call it the answer? <laughs> Lincoln. That's what Mike thought, too. It's actually William Howard Taft in 1910 threw out the first pitch. I think most of you knew that, but Lincoln was a good guess. April 14th, 1910. <laughs> yeah. He would have, but he was busy. So... Uh, Here's some stuff that's coming up. Next week, uh, Reverend Cynthia James is going to be here. Uh, it's going to be our guest speaker. Yeah. And she's also going to do a workshop after the uh, second service over in the community center about uh, your authentic voice and finding your authentic voice. So uh, be here next Sunday for that. And then um, I got a parenting workshop coming up, a four-week parenting workshop that starts on uh, February 2nd and uh, Thursday nights. So if you have little people running around at home and you'd like a little help with uh, parenting, I'm still doing that after all this time. Lincoln was in my first class, as a matter of fact. Um, having a little trouble. And so uh, that's coming up. And then uh, Reverend Zamira is going to be hosting a uh, To Be Shabbat, a, um, a ceremony next Sunday evening, right? And so it's, uh, it's a Seder. And um, there's food involved, as there is with Seder. So if you'd like to be a part of it, please sign up ahead of time so we'll have enough food. And that's what's coming up. And uh, life is good. And I got some great news for you here. The Mile High Choir is here right up there. Yeah. And we also have an incredible guest singer here today that I'm very excited about. Please welcome Jennifer Burnett. Hello, Mile High. Happy Sunday. Welcome to Mile High Church. So good to see you all. Yes, and welcome to those of you who are watching online. It's a cold morning here in Colorado, so uh, I really am grateful. We are really grateful that you came out in this yeah, cold if you're, morning. If you're watching in Southern California, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> but the rest of us trudged out in the snow and are grateful to be together. So thank you so much for being with us in spiritual community today. It's always a joy to come into this warm sanctuary, not only warm physically, but warm with the presence that we are together as a community. And I always love our vision and mission because they feel very warm and, and uh, connecting to me. So we're going to speak aloud. We invite you to join us in reciting our vision and mission today. Let's start with our vision. Oneness revealed, a world of love, peace, and abundance for all. And our mission, to serve as a spiritual beacon for personal empowerment and global enlightenment. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to turn everyone's attention before we go into prayer this morning to this blue peace candle over there. Um, one of our practitioners lights it early uh, on Sunday morning, and it's there to represent um, the challenges going on in the world where we uh, want to send our consciousness. Um, sometimes those challenges are so many, we can't mention them all in church. And sometimes, for a lot of us, this is the only oasis from all of those challenges going on in the world as well. But uh, I invite us to turn our attention to it just in, in recognition of, of so much going on in the news that hurts our hearts this week, mass shootings in California. Um, our hearts break and say, no, not again, as we see another video of a young man in Tennessee who was killed. Conflicts in our world, in Israel, ongoing ones in Ukraine. Um, it's hard to carry that weight. Um, we're doing our Back to Basics series, and it's important to remember we are an optimistic and positive philosophy, but that's not so that we can turn away from the struggles of the world. It's so that we can bravely and courageously take a consciousness of hope and for human dignity and, and take them into these issues, ask ourselves the hard questions that need to be asked, and do all of our work in making this more of a world that works for everyone. So I invite us to take a deep breath and that courage to be conscious even in challenging moments as we move into this time of silence, of song, and of prayer. God is in this place I can feel the mighty power and the grace I can hear the brush of angel wings I see glory on each face Surely the presence of God is in this place
And out of this stillness and this moment of prayerfulness, we sense that infinite light. Feeling it call to us. Beckoning us into the center of the truth of who and what we are. Always calling, so lovingly, so beautifully, so profoundly. We heed that call and have chosen to heed it this morning by being present here, by whatever has brought us here this morning in that beautiful concert of the divine light that we are dancing in this beautiful world and stepping into life and the path that we walk upon and finding ourselves in spiritual community this morning. What I accept and affirm is whatever has guided us to be here today, whatever has brought us here, whatever motivations are in our heart, that they are met and indeed exceeded beyond our wildest measure as we spend this time in community this morning as we recognize and feel and sense that impetus, that, that divine call constantly reminding us of the true nature of us and of every being on this planet. And so we bring ourselves fully to this moment, breathing in and breathing out, feeling the presence of each other in this space, feeling the presence of each other in our world, knowing that we are connected in that oneness to all beings everywhere. We are one. And we stand in the truth of that. And know that that power and that faith that we've activated by taking those steps to be present here today are met with the divine grace that God is leading us forward ever more powerfully on our life journey. We don't take our big problems to our little God. Indeed, in this prayer, we bring our little problems to our big God. And we know that they are met by the love and the light of the universal presence. We know this for ourselves and for all beings everywhere, that love is activated in hearts everywhere, that peace and wholeness abound. We accept this for ourselves. We accept this for every person of every faith tradition, for we know that anywhere and any time that anyone comes together to celebrate the nature of God, it is good. We give thanks that this is true right here and right now. We give thanks for this moment we are in right now and we simply release it and let it go and let it be. It is done. And so it is.
some inspiration today from Paulo Coelho. Solitude is not the absence of company, but the moment when our soul is free to speak and help us decide what to do with our life. And from Henri Nouwen, when we pray to God or search for God in silence, we learn to recognize him in the many little ideas, meetings, happenings, signs, and wonders along the way. And from our founder, Ernest Holmes, no man need prepare to meet his God. He is meeting him every day and each hour in the day. He meets him in the rising sun, in the flowing stream, in the budding rose, in the joy of friendship and love, and in the silence of his own soul. One power, one power, one power. There's one power, it's invisible, yet you see it everywhere and every day. One power in Indescribable, yet you speak it with every word you say. It's mysterious until you know the truth. It's as simple as the love inside of you. Call it God, call it Spirit, call it Jesus. Call it Lord, call it Buddha, Bahá'u'lláh, angel's wings or heaven's door, but whatever name you give it, it's all one power, can't you see? It's the power of the love in you and me. One power, one power. One power We speak so many languages Different clothing, different colors, different names But different is only dangerous When we forget that in our hearts we're all the same We'll remember once we close our eyes to see That such distances were never meant to be Call it God, call it Spirit, call it Jesus, call it Lord Call it Buddha, Baha'u'llah, angel's wings or heaven's door It's Muhammad. It's your mind, it's your soul, or it's your sign. It's the universe, it's music, Mother Earth or Father Time. But whatever name you give it, it's all one power, can't you see? It's the sweetness of release 
It's the joy of inspiration. It's the sunshine on your face. It's the birthright of all nations. And it's the boundlessness of space. It's the beauty of a baby. The serenity of sleep. It's the anger you abandon for the love that's most deep into one power. One power. What we are is one power. One power. It's the power. wonderful band today. We're happy to have Randy Chavez here with us. Wonderful to have you back, Randy. And of course, we have Bijou and Mike and Kent with us. We are so blessed. That's an iconic, wonderful, beautiful song written by the great Daniel Namod. I just love that we get to have it sung here in our community. It's a wonderful gift to have it, and it's a wonderful gift to be with you here today, it's Josh. nice to be with you, Michelle. Yes. We're going to end this series by weaving a message together and doing a little dance. Did you know? Oh, I didn't tell you about the dance. Okay, you got it. All right, good. Yeah, that'll do. That'll do. <laughs> We're completing our wonderful Back to Basic series today. You can see the slide up there. It's been a five-week series, Spiritual Practices for Healing, Thriving, and Peace of Mind, which we've been enjoying very much. I have loved these messages. It's an opportunity for us to reconnect with basic ideas of our teaching. And today we really want to end our series talking about stillness. Our talk today is titled The Heart of Stillness, Revealing Truth Where You Are. And so it's been a wonderful contemplative experience to work with this message and to really dive into stillness and to also watch many people in our community using the great materials that you created online for our community to use. So we have many small groups who've been meeting to discuss this material and move through the practices and the, the opportunities that are in the materials as well as people just downloading it on their own, which has been really great. So thank you for that. Thank you yeah, for doing do it that. yourself spirituality. Exactly. I like it. Yeah. yeah. And what I love about it is that uh, I know after so many years of being part of a church like this, it can get really easy to get caught up in the Sunday only gig. But what I've watched is that people who really change their lives profoundly find ways to integrate these principles and practices into their life on a more daily basis. And so downloading materials and going through them with people, other people, uh, t taking classes, getting involved in groups and activities, help us to really uh, find ways to live this out and not just have it be a nice idea in our minds. So thank you. That's great. And so as we head into stillness today, I want to start with a, a fun story as I was looking for, for sources. I found um, the wonderful comedian Dave Barry write, writing about uh, stillness and calm. And he said, any wildlife expert will tell you that when confronted with a potentially dangerous animal, you must remain calm and not make any sudden movements. That's why I always say, the hell with wildlife experts. <laughs> And I liked, I liked this story because uh, sometimes when presented with two ministers or a community saying, be more still, the hell with stillness, I've got things to do, I've got a wild life, I've got places to go, people to see, things to do. I've uh, talked many times I, uh, with my prayer partner about the, the illusion that the busier you are, the more important you are. The busier you are, the more you're actually accomplishing but what if it's actually the opposite? 
Now, I'm a fifth-generation Coloradan, and I was uh, born in Salida, Colorado, and my grandparents had a cabin way up in Garfield, right below Monarch Pass. And we would go there almost every weekend in the summer to my grandparents' cabin, and we would fish. I would read books. I love the Happy Hollisters. <laughs> and we would uh, be able to just run and play and in this area. And I would often find myself over in this foresty area just uh, laying down in the grass and watching the wind blow through the trees for hours. Just feeling this absolute stillness. I didn't think about much. I just was very still. And that was the first time in my young life that I think I can remember feeling that much stillness and calm through being out in nature. I also have felt that same feeling uh, watching a, a fire burn at a campfire. I know I don't look much like a camper. My husband says for me, roughing it is a hotel without room service, <laughs> which I can relate to now that I'm a grown-up girl. But as a young woman, I camped a lot, and I used to love watching the campfire burn, and I love the fire in the fireplace in our home, just sitting and watching the fire burn and just feeling the stillness from that. I uh, love uh, having been in the ocean, I've gotten to dive into the ocean and just feeling the stillness under the water. I used to ice skate, and in ice skating when I was young, we did patch, which is they put a figure eight on the, on the ice, they would etch it, and you would practice your edges for hours just by skating around. Stillness. You all have moments, I'm sure, where you've experienced profound stillness that can almost be a shock to our busy life because we're so busy doing and going and making appointments and being sure we're here and getting on our, our devices and making sure we get our Wordle done every day and all the good stuff that we're doing that we can sometimes let the busyness and the hecticness, hecticness of life take over to such a degree that we forget our stillness, forget to bring forth our stillness. And I have come to believe that moments of stillness are so rejuvenating for my soul, for my body, for my essence, that I see stillness uh, like feeding my body, that I need food in order to survive. I see stillness as like putting gasoline in a car that, that needs gasoline and, or plugging in a car. I plug in my car to get it juice, that we need power, we need energy. And we think that we get our power and our energy from all that we're doing, but it's really the opposite. And today is just a wonderful for me basic reminder for myself and all who can hear this message that those moments of stillness and are rejuvenating to our spirit. They provide a connection and anchoring to our innermost sanctuary of light and love that provide wisdom and health and energy that, that we can live our life out. And so being still is a powerful, powerful thing for the spiritual life walking on this beautiful earth, being still, and I shall be still. Yeah, it makes me want to be quiet for a little while, yeah, too. Yeah, doesn't it? it just makes and you want to isn't it wonderful to know that there is an alternative yes. to uh, a busy, hectic life yes. uh, to create for us. Mm -hmm. You know, Julia Cameron, who wrote The, the Artist's Way, she said that the creative process uh, is not one of control, but of surrender. Yeah. And it's not, oh, I give up surrender <laughs> or uh, the hell with this peace stuff. I'm going to go out and curse at somebody and maybe that'll make <laughs> me feel better. It's, uh, it, it, it's a kind of surrender where we, we drop into that place of quiet within us where the divine can come and, and meet us. Right. Uh, and it can create a, a lot out of that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were to ask me to perhaps pick, you know, one line from the Holy Bible that speaks to spiritual living and what our teaching is all about, it would be from Psalm 46 and those famous words, uh, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And, and, and the first part of that that really speaks to me is, is that be still. It's not be anxious and know that I am God. It's not run around like a chicken with its head cut off and know that I am God. It's not be in, in judgment or in story and know that I am God. It's, it's be still and know that I am God. And, and thank God stillness is a metaphor because as a jittery person, I would never be able to experience the divine. But stillness, it's, it's answering that call to go inward. 
It's answering that call to humble ourselves before a creative power, to let it speak and live and and become in in our own heart. And, And I love this idea that there's nothing you must do to earn the love of a holy presence. All you have to do is release all of the you-know-what that is sometimes on the surface of our consciousness, the busyness, the phones, the 24-hour-7 news cycle of our own heads, to know that that love, that divine creativity is right there if we can only answer that call to stillness, which I I believe is, is calling us inward all the time. Maybe you even feel it right now. And like Michelle says, it's an inner resource. It's an inner light. It's an inner fire that can, not us, but can, through us, create a sense of healing, a sense of knowingness, a sense of purpose, a sense of everything is okay-ness. You know, the, the second part I love about that statement, it's so interesting, be still and know that I am God. It's an interesting statement in the psalm because we don't know if it's from the first person or if it's in the the third person. It's not be still and see God in all things. It's be still and know that I am. There's something about that term, I am God. Uh, Ernest Holmes says, Our search after the place where reality may be found is ended when we come at long last to the simple revelation of truth. That all the power there is and all the presence there is must be the living spirit. God is an immediate presence which can be found only and directly and immediately in our own soul. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. used to uh, talk about the, that part in Exodus where Moses is communicating with Yahweh. And Yahweh says, I am that I am. There's this deep metaphysical um, teaching in that. And King would go on to say that God is the only being that gets to be named I am. (laughs) I have to be I am Josh. You have to be I am Michelle. Martin Luther King Jr. has to be I am Martin Luther King Jr. But, But when we declare that I am, when we're in that place of stillness, we're not just saying our own name. We're not just pointing out our own identity, but we're allowing the divine to acknowledge itself in us. Not to say, I am God, but to say, within this I am, there is that divine creative power, that divine essence. It's the same I am in you and in me and in all of us. And when we get still, it becomes that resonance in our hearts. It announces itself as as that deeper peace. And this is not only how we connect with the divine, but it's how we lay forth the foundation for a powerful life. Uh, One more thought from Holmes. The Almighty has maintained a profound silence at all times and yet has eternally revealed himself in the innermost recesses of our own consciousness. Beautiful. Yes. Yes, I love what you're saying about this because I think we underestimate often that power that lives within us. And that's what I love about this teaching is that we teach and talk about stopping that underestimation. And we know we're underestimating that power within us if we're always looking to the solutions out there, always looking for everybody's input out there. Am I good or am I not good? Am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? And it's not that it's bad and horrible to do that. It's just that if that's our only source for how we're living our life, we're missing this I am-ness that lives and breathes and has itself through each one of us. And we're missing the the benefits of truly being guided, of truly feeling that sense of partnership with something within us that is greater than us. I, I know that for me, I've said many times that as I look out into my world and I I see the things that might happen or are happening and I'm worried about them or I'm concerned or I wonder if and I I wonder that, I can spend hours and hours mulling over that. But the greatest power that I can have is this absolute awareness of this I am that I am that I can trust and have faith so that as I start to find myself tempted to worry, tempted to get out of the now moment, tempted to think about things that I have absolutely no control over, I can feel that presence that can tell me, you know, I don't know how that's going to turn out. 
But when I get there, something in me absolutely always knows what to do, is guided, is supported, is, is uh, uplifted by that, and that I can listen to that. And I think, I think we mentioned in the last service that I think is so profound that sometimes we avoid that stillness because of what we're afraid of we might encounter within us, right? Right. Some, mm -hmm. Sometimes we wonder if all the noise in our head is but a defense mechanism against coming now right. because of you know, the possibility of transformation that can happen in this present moment, having to listen and actually confront our feelings, right. uh, having to actually face uh, the story of our worries and ask ourselves if it's really true and to, to be vulnerable right. in this moment. And sometimes we, think, we feel, and I hear people say, I just couldn't handle that. If I opened up that that fear in me or that sadness in me or if I had to face that. I used to have a therapist who would, who would, who would tell me that she suspected, well quite frankly my mother did told me this too to be honest, that I was avoiding my inner life by keeping myself so busy. And I used to reject that, oh, I'm not doing that. But then I could tell that I was really afraid to be with that inner light within me that might guide me into some of my issues, my sadness, my memories. But what I've come to learn is whether it's encountering my own inner memories or even in the last few years when I've faced a lot of drama and trauma in my life, what I've discovered is that the more I practice on an ongoing basis, this notion of stillness and seek out those moments in the quiet and remember those moments in nature and remember that feeling of the stillness even in a busy moment, the more I can have it any time I need it. If I'm in crisis, if I have to make a decision, if I'm in a challenging conversation, it doesn't matter. That stillness is there to guide me if I've courted it along the way. If I have on a regular basis trudged through my inner pathways to find myself in the presence of stillness, breathed into it, then when I really need it, I know the way in. And so it's important to embrace that stillness. I have taken a, a, a page out of the Dr. Roger Teal ac ac acronymic universe today. <laughs> and so I have just a brief acronym that to me represents a recipe that we could use if we're open to practicing more stillness. And it's using the word still. And so the word still is an S, silence. It's just being willing to have a little more silence. Sometimes I drive my car places, and believe it or not, I don't listen to podcasts or music or books on tape or anything. I just drive in the silence. I, I can feel my little hand reaching because I sometimes want to sing or play loud music, and I'll just take it back and say, Let's just drive in the silence. Let's just be present to driving and watching the road and just being with ourselves and just drive. Stillness, finding and incorporating stillness into our life. And then the T stands for truth because with that stillness, the truth will reveal itself to us. That we can't deny you of. The truth about what's really going on inside of you. The truth about who you really are, both the good, the bad, and the ugly, as they would say. The moments of sadness that come out as we face things in our life or in our world may show up. They might, absolutely. We can't guarantee you that they won't. But so will that deep presence that is the true nature of us will show itself. The I is for inclusive. When I allow myself to include all of it, even that stuff that I would like to avoid, and just include it in my presence say, wow, the minute I got still, I got really sad. And having, having been a person for so many years in my early life was, was deprived of my sadness and tears, I'm now proudly a big old crier. I will cry and snot everywhere. <laughs> and I'm very happy and proud about that. So I include everything that comes up. And then the L is listen. Because when it comes up, I'm afraid about dealing with it, but I know that at that stillness that I've courted tells me, you just need to cry a little bit. You need a journal. You need to call somebody. You need to talk to somebody. You need to reach out. I will listen. And the last one is love. I will love myself and my own journey unconditionally and love myself enough to let the stillness lead me back to me. That's what still can do for us. 
a great recipe to support us. And now I think I should get a degree from the Acronymic University. Dr. So, Roger yeah, would be Dr. very Roger proud, be yes. Proud. I hope he gives me that degree one and, of these days. You know, spe <laughs> speaking of love, and I don't know if you have found this to, to be true, sometimes it, it's in the stillness that I'm really safe to love. Yes. And where some of the most profound healing in my relationships have happened in that place of stillness, to get out of that. I alone can fix it kind of consciousness that we can get into and, and to be in that still place. And I remember being uh, several years ago, uh, being at a point of, of a fracture in a relationship with someone I cared uh, deeply who was having a mental health crisis. And maybe you've had this too, where nothing was helping. Any, any reaching out or participating on my part was going to wind up in me getting hurt and this person probably getting worse. And so I had to cut off contact with this person. And I remember how powerful it was each and every day to, to meet that person in the silence, mm -hmm. to get rid of the story, the drama, the worry, the concern, and just meet that person at that soul-to-soul -soul place and just send them light, mm -hmm. surround them. And it was a daily practice that allowed me to love them even beyond the seeming fractured of things. And, and ultimately the relationship, it's not where I want it to be, but it did improve. It did get better. And it's powerful to realize it's not all ours to do, but when we get to that place of still and stillness and silence, um, the soul reveals itself. You know, we might say that that spiritual practice reveals soul awareness. Absolutely. It's an awareness of, of wholeness, uh, even when we're in the fragmented piece of the story of our lives. Um, and it's, a, it's an awareness that this too shall pass when a challenge feels in the moment like it's all there is. Or even in a moment where we're at our worst, we can remember our best because of this soul awareness. And, you know, just one more comment about the statement, be still and know that I am God and why I think it reflects our teaching so much is that we don't, not only do we not have to do anything to earn God's love, but, but we don't have to have another medium. We don't have to have a person or a right book or even a, a right church to connect through the sacrament that is our own consciousness if we're willing to still ourselves and to see all of the creativity in us that can come forward. I, I love something Mother Teresa said. She said, just once let the love of God take entire and absolute possession of your heart. Let it become to your heart like a second nature. In the silence of the heart, God speaks. And it reveals to me, you know, those perhaps most powerful and profound words of, of Jesus, that, that the kingdom of heaven is, is within you. It's within each and every one of us, but we have to take that time, intentional time, to nurture it so it can come forth and we can begin to see that we don't live in created lives, but in creative lives uh, that the Spirit can do much through us to accomplish. Definitely, definitely. So as we bring our series and our message to a close, I also think that it's important for us, as Josh is saying, to utilize that stillness to bring us wisdom about our pathway in our spiritual life, our pathway of, of participating in this church or any other community, of allowing ourselves to really hear our own wisdom about what's, what, ours, what is ours to do because it doesn't lead us astray. It can lead us into the path of great beauty and great love and great joy if we will let it. And so um, allowing that to happen is one of the greatest gifts of this teaching. Allowing myself to experience that is one of the greatest gifts I've ever received. It's helped me to learn to observe my thoughts, to observe my feelings, to feel my feelings, to be, be fully incorporated in my being and not be in denial about who and what I am or what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking or what's going on inside of me. And when I don't know, I can use that beautiful pathway of stillness to lead me back. So... Thank you very much for this beautiful series. Anything else that you would like to impart upon us, O oh Wise One? No, it's nice to share. I don't, I've never wanted to take notes during a talk before, and I almost <laughs> did that with a couple of the things you were saying. <laughs> I'd like to close with a, a reading from an American novelist, Wendell Berry, who says, When despair for the world grows in me, in fear of what my life and my children's may be, I go and lie down in the wood. Drake rests in his beauty on the water and on the great heron feeds, I come into the peace of still water. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. So let us be free in that inner world of the Most High. I invite us into prayer and invite our practitioner prayer partners to stand with us.
in this prayerful consciousness. And as we stand together in the light and the love that is the true nature of our being, we can feel that, that sense of stillness, using our imaginations perhaps to bring forth a, an image from nature. I often like to see a beautiful lake. In that cabin I mentioned in Garfield, there was a pond and it was tree-lined, it was a round pond, and I would stand there and watch the still water, knowing that below the surface there were trout and other fish and rocks, and, and the beauty of that pond captivated me. And each one of us is like that beautiful pond, still waters, the top of our beingness, the, the world of form, and even though there are things moving around and things happening, there's an element, there's a part of us that is at the core and at the center, just like this beautiful pond. And if we plumb the surface and go deeper into the water, we can feel the stillness that we can inhabit and that inhabits us. It is the great I am that I am. It is the God essence within us, as us, expressing through us. It is the aspect of this beautiful universe that never leaves us, never abandons us, never goes away. However, we may at times abandon our awareness of it, forget the truth of it as us. Yet this moment, now, is a moment where we choose to remember where we choose to see and sense that deep stillness that is the very nature of our being. And we allow it to go forth with us clearly, powerfully, and profoundly as we walk forth from this beautiful sanctuary into our world and into the life path that we live with all of our relationships and decisions and activities, all of our dreams, all of the challenges and opportunities, all of it, we meet with this powerful stillness, activated, remembered, accepted, and embraced. And I am so grateful that this is the truth of us. For as we go forth as these calm beings of love and light to be with the issues of our world and our personal life, the more we meet those with this powerful energy, the more we are a transforming energy ourselves unto our life and the life we share together. And I'm grateful that this is who and what we are. I am grateful that this powerful presence that God is as us is so very real and active in us as us. And I simply, in absolute faith and trust, then release this prayer. I let it go, releasing it into the law, knowing that as it has been spoken, it simply is so. We let go, we let God, we let it be, and so it is. Amen. It's the moment of creation. It's an everlasting peace. It's the freedom of forgiveness it's the sweetness of release it's the joy of inspiration it's the sunshine on your face it's the birthright of all nations it's the boundlessness of space it's the beauty of a baby the serenity of sleep it's the anger you abandon for the love that's most deep. It's a one power. One power. Oh. It's the power of the love forever in you. It's the power of the love in you. Me. Jennifer Burnett, Kent Routen Strauss. 
Melissa Peterson, it was so wonderful to watch you perform that as well on our ASL feed. So check that out on YouTube. It was just a beautiful expression. Uh, as we move into our time of uh, offering, of course, we thank you so much for all your financial support of Mile High Church. Uh, I also just want to share something cool with you all. Uh, and some of you may or may not know this, but we have Science of Mind study groups in the Ukraine. Uh, I believe we've had a presence there for about uh, 30 years. And at Mile High Church, we have the honor of now sponsoring um, these uh, Science of Mind communities in the Ukraine. I'm so grateful to Reverend Chris Plim, uh, Irene Medelik, and the team that's helping with that. It's so uh, powerful to see how committed these folks are to their uh, teaching. Sometimes we'll have Zoom meetings, and you know, because of Elon Musk, they have the internet out there, but they may not have electricity. So people um, doing their work, uh, doing their study groups, having these calls with candles lit. And Mile High Church, we've been able to provide thousands of dollars to them to help uh, with supplies and to help their families. We've been able to translate our own Adventures in Faith materials as well as uh, Centers for Spiritual Living class materials for them to study. And I know they're, they're so grateful, but we are so grateful to get to provide that for them. And we wouldn't be able to do this uh, without your incredible donation. So thank you personally for letting me to do, get, get to do something so cool because of your generosity to uh, Mile High Church. And we'll continue to communicate uh, the great ways that we're able to partner with them as they go through this incredibly challenging time in their country. So with that, let's take our gifts and bless them however we choose to give them. But we all get to say an affirmation together. Divine love as me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, and all that I circulate. And so it is. Oh. 
Hello, Mile Hires. Dr. Roger here. I'm very excited to share with you that this year of 2023 marks the 40th anniversary of the Mile High Church Foundation. And that's very exciting to me. How it was that back in 1983, the foundation was formed as we were seeking to double the acreage of our site and build much needed facilities. And thus the foundation was created as a place for people to make special donations of stock or properties and things like that. It served a very valuable function. And then several years later, it was revived to create the long-term endowment for Mile High Church. And that's been its mission for many, many decades since then. And I'm very proud of the work that so many dedicated Mile Hires have accomplished. The foundation has had some very devoted board members over many years, and they created a Nautilus Society, a society of people who had pledged that a portion of their estate would be dedicated to the Mile High Church Foundation. And it's very outstanding at this point. In fact, we have seen nearly a 20% increase in, the, in last year in foundation members via the Nautilus Society. So the Nautilus Society is one way you can become involved. And throughout this month, we're going to be offering lots of information and opportunities to get to know foundation members, to have your questions answered, and to consider taking that step of devoted uh, commitment to the long term for Mile High. We're here to serve you and support you, and ultimately we all win because of that. I love Mile High Church, as you know, and I'm excited that we are together creating this strong foundation for an enduring future for this great spiritual beacon. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you a lot in February. Thank you, Dr. Roger, and thank you to the Mile High Choir and the director, Stacy Landis. Thank you to Jennifer Burnett, our wonderful musicians. And to our wonderful lead ministers, what a beautiful message that we've oh, had this thank morning. You. Thank you. So I just want to welcome anyone in the room who is new to Mile High Church. Please stop by our Welcome Center. Uh, there will be lots of information there for you to learn more about us. For those of you that are online, I encourage you to go to our website. It will give you lots of great information on Mile High Church. Our practitioners have come down front. Come down and stop if you're in the room for a, a short affirmative prayer. And if you are online, you can, or at home, here at home too, you can do a prayer online 24-7. She's got one. All right. Uh, this is our incredible youth director, Stacy Butters. Uh -huh. Yay! And uh, Stacy has curated a, a series for um, us, all of us, this year called What I Wish My Parents Would Know. And uh, as a parent of a teenager, I had convinced myself that I would understand everything he was going through until that illusion was uh, popped when he was about 15 years old. And then a pandemic happened. And so there is uh, so much that uh, our, our teens want us to hear. And you've created this wonderful series uh, that begins today after service uh, that begins that process. That's true. And what I love is that um, while you, if you have teens in your life, 
you are maybe living this, but it's also, if you're anything like me, putting a little information in your pocket. If you have younger kids, I think this is come spend an hour, or anyone who might want some info to support anyone in their life who might be on an LGBTQ path. Uh, the one we're doing today is gender expression and the evolution of sexuality. So I really hope you'll uh, hang out with us at 1145 over in the community center. It's an hour and then we have time planned after for questions. Um, but this one is also near and dear to my heart as the recent parent of some teenagers. Um, and I think it's just full of great info. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> And we want you to know that next Sunday, the great Reverend Cynthia James will be with us as our guest speaker. We're looking forward to that, yes. And she also has a new book out. My microphone's suddenly coming off. She has a new book out, and she's going to be doing a workshop with us after church based on her new book about awakening your authentic voice. It's a beautiful roadmap. So I hope you'll be with us for that. And we invite you now to stand as we do our benediction and peace song. So we go forth in love, in light, in joy, walking this path of stillness, wholeness, guidance in every moment of our lives, knowing that we are truly and deeply blessed by this reality of beingness. Thank you, life. We let this go and let it be, and so it is. Amen. <laughs>